My fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. Welcome to the What Matters Today podcast from the Geneva Graduate Institute. I'm Dan Graham, head of communications at the Institute. In this podcast series, we ask members of our faculty to comment on key global issues. The Iraq war started on 20 March 2003, when US forces invaded the country with the global goal of disarming it, freeing its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. The US formally declared the end of the war on 15 December 2011. As today is the 20th anniversary of the Iraq war, we look at its long shadow and how it still looms. How has the war impacted Iraq and its people? Did Operation Iraqi Freedom, the US codename for the invasion, actually provide freedom? These are only a few of the questions that we will discuss in this episode of What Matters Today. My guest today is Professor Mohammed Mahmoud Mohamedou, who is Deputy Director of the Geneva Graduate Institute as well as Professor of International History and Politics and Director of Executive Education here at the Institute. I just want to note that Professor Mohamedou's first book was on Iraq, where he conducted field research, and the 2003 war is mentioned extensively in his 9-11 trilogy, with a dedicated chapter in the last book. This may be a big question, but what has been the primary impact of the war on Iraq, its people, and its neighbors in the region? Well, it is indeed a, a big question, but I think it's uh, it's relevant in the sense that uh, the war itself is is quite enormous in its impact. It, it is a bit of a paradoxical conflict because, in many ways, it's derivative from other events, specifically nine eleven and the war in the nineteen nineties, the the first Iraq War, that's the Gulf War. And so, in that sense, it's interesting to see that the war itself has not necessarily moved on its own logic as much as it was, on the one hand, a reaction to 9-11 on the part of the Bush administration, wrongly so, because obviously it emerged subsequently that Iraq had no nuclear weapons and that, and that of course, Iraq had no relationship whatsoever to 9-11. In fact, uh, within a year or so after the invasion, uh, the US administration itself admitted that. Uh, President Bush himself made a statement to that effect. Exactly. But I think it's also very important to keep in mind that a lingering question had been with the U.S. administrations, and, and by this I mean the Clinton administration and the Bush father administration, uh, had been sort of the frustration from not having closed the deal on the 1990-91 Gulf War with the Saddam Hussein regime. And so the war continued throughout the 1990s with the embargo, and then after that we got to, to 2003. I would say two large consequences destabilization generally in the country itself and throughout the region. And I think an important sort of setback to the rule of law internationally. It's often forgotten that the war in Iraq was illegal. It was not sanctioned by the United Nations Security Council. In fact, explicitly so many countries, including, for instance, one of the P5, France had expressed uh, vehemently uh, its opposition. Um, this was the uh, famous speech by the French Foreign Minister Dominique de Villepin. That's right. Opposing the decision. And millions were marching around the world at that time. It's a bit forgotten that that was the, the sort of the illegal nature of that because subsequently the UN Security Council sort of did a ex post facto rationalization by welcoming the coalition provisional authority that managed, quote unquote, uh, Iraq subsequently. So I think um, there's very little positive, really, that came from that a war. It destabilized Iraq. Iraq is still de destabilized in many ways. It introduced a um, logic of force over international law. And I think it ushered this era in the 2000s on top of the terrorism of those years and the insecurity uh, and the international malaise. It introduced this notion that law could be set aside uh, and force could be a response to such consequences, uh, to such actions. Um, and so what you had, particularly in the Middle East, it was an era of destabilization that I think has still cast a long shadow all the way to um, where we are today. Thanks for that. And so the U.S. codename for the invasion was Operation Iraqi Freedom. 
Are Iraqis better off today? Did they want freedom to begin with? So, for example, did they want the Saddam Hussein regime to be toppled? And do they consider themselves free today? There's several elements there. On the element of wanting Saddam Hussein out for sure, that had been for many, many years, in fact, decades, um, an explicit opposition by a large majority of the Iraqi society to the Ba'ath regime, who, which had led the country since 1968 and had been particularly authoritarian and ruthless and had grown so even more as the years of the embargo came. And so that clearly was something that was uh, desired on the part of the population. But of course, we know that populations, once they topple dictators, can come to regret that. And famously, the person whom you see sort of uh, hitting on the statue of Saddam Hussein was found in a documentary a year later saying he regretted his actions. This gives you a sense of how much within a year, disenchantment can sort of come in in that way. Are they better off? Well, the numbers are quite staggering, about 270,000 people killed, out of which 190 roughly civilians. Uh, it's a mini genocide throughout the country. You mentioned um, the, the important confessional element that materialized in this country, which had long been based on, on different groups, religiously, Shia, Sunnah, ethnically, Kurds, Arabs. Um, and so all of that had been paradoxically kind of kept under control by the authoritarian state, not in a positive way, so to speak, that it was not an uplifting way, but it was sort of a, a, a Pandora's box phenomenon after the invasion where you see this playing out throughout the country with high levels of violence and pretty brutal violence. There's a certain brutality that materializes after the war, of course, in the context of the use of torture by the United States. Abu Ghraib, which was modeled on what was taking place in Guantanamo and in Bahram in Afghanistan, sort of introduced a certain uh, terror in that society, which was replayed um, within the Iraqi society. Beyond that, the fact that the country was supposed to move to multipartism, sort of um, independence, management of its oil resources, gave that promise. But truth be told, the reality is that you have now high levels of corruption, you have had mismanagement, you have had confessional, confessional infighting, you have a sort of Lebanonization of, of Iraq that plays out throughout the two, 20, 2000s and 2010s uh, with a US occupation uh, for a solid 10 years. And then since then, very much under sort of the, the influence of, of the United States. I don't think that Iraq is better off for sure. But two wrongs don't make a right. That doesn't mean that the Saddam Hussein era was better. No, it was a republic of fear, to quote a, an, a famous book at the time talking about that regime. But I think the, the way the country has evolved, I think, has meant a huge step back when it comes to state building, to societal integration, and to, I think, sort of the, the role of the the militias, the terrorist groups that came subsequently, ISIS, for instance, Al-Qaeda before that, and sort of the overall positioning of the country within the Middle East, which was very much sort of um, hollowed out from a, a regional player to a country sort of essentially under life support all this time. One of the consequences of the war in Iraq was the birth of the Islamic State, otherwise known as ISIS. It seemed to have gone quiet during certain periods of the war, but it definitely reemerged in 2011, taking advantage of instability in Iraq. Uh, do you think the rise of ISIS was inevitable or was this a direct offshoot of the war? It's a direct offshoot of the war. In fact, so explicit in that link that uh, it's, it's striking to see that, again, paradoxically, under the authoritarian rule of Saddam Hussein, the Ba'ath regime, you never had a terrorist problem. Um, you had a police state problem, you had an authoritarianism problem, you had a ruthlessness problem. But terrorism per se, as we define it, performed by non-state armed groups and sort of projecting that type of violence was never there to be seen after the, the uh, or, or very minimally in, in, in some instances throughout the 1980s related to the, to the first Gulf War with Iran with specific groups and some Islamist movements uh, on the fringes at that time. But subsequently, what you had is this notion of sort of, again, this opening of the Pandora's box and what you, within, I think, the, 
on April 9th, the invasion uh, ends, so from March 20th to April 9th of 2003. By June of that year, you had the first movements appearing. So this is Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, uh, who is an independent terrorism entrepreneur, and then within a year or so sort of links up with al-Qaeda. And he conducts that summer a series of high-profile attack, one on the United Nations headquarters. That's the, right, yeah. The death of the human rights uh, representative at the time, uh, Sergio Vieira de Mello, um, and a large number of casualties and an attack on the Jordanian embassy at the time as well. Sort of the opening salvo of what would be the highest levels of suicide terrorism, for instance, historically, ever. And this is very striking. And consequently, within a few years, of course, this gives the opportunity to first Al-Qaeda and then the Islamic State to sort of move their uh, theater of operations, to use a military term, to Iraq, where now you have U.S. troops. You do not have to go to the United States. You have now U.S. troops that you can battle, that you can target. And this sets off the, these years of the ISIS years that are very much playing in that sense. ISIS itself actually is very explicit about that. I recall the 2017 video at the time when ISIS was uh, releasing these videos all the time in a staccato manner in which the opening, and I think the title was The War Recorded, in one of the, op the, the opening shot of that video was the arrival of U.S. troops in Iraq. So making a direct link in their cast belly between, in their storytelling, uh, that particular relationship and that. I think what we saw through the illegality of the war, through the, the, the ruthlessness and the brashness of the approach by the United States, the occupation itself, I, uh, the role of PMCs, private military contractors, who, which were roaming free at the time, Blackwater and Titan, and there's two massacres in 2005 and 2006 on civilians. I think what we saw with sort of the, the high levels of violence there was a certain militarization of Iraqi society, which itself had long been militarized in slow motion by the years of the Ba'ath regime and the war in, in Kuwait, and then, of course, the embargo years. And all of that came to a certain sort of fulcrum in which ultimately you had this kind of degeneration societally uh, setting the stage also naturally for ISIS to come and so do the violence that it did throughout the years of 2013, roughly to 2017. Can it reemerge? Of course, it's in the nature of these movements that they are ebbing and flowing all the time, depending on the situation. But I think in the specific configuration of ISIS, uh, which I discussed in my Theory of ISIS book, I don't think that essentially the, any return of such phenomenon per se will materialize in the manner that we saw it. I see it more on a more diffuse, regional, international type of violence. I think the problem now is more at the level of the militias, of the hollowed nature of the Iraqi state. Last year, the, um, the parliament was occupied, uh, January 6th style, um, sort of very much showing the, the, the weakness of those institutions, uh, which are supposed to be free by now. Right. Uh, thank you for that. Um... If the war did indeed end in 2011, why are U.S. troops still in Iraq? And, and why did they not withdraw like they did in Afghanistan? Well, I think it has to do fundamentally with the way the United States looked at Iraq from the very beginning. I think from, for them, the issue of Iraq was, as we said, related to a number of things. It's interesting to see that George W. Bush is discussing plans for invading Iraq as early as September 17, 2001. That's within a week of 9-11. And by November, he's instructing Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld to make preparations with the Pentagon. We know this from Bob Woodward's book, Plan of Attack, and several other sources. There's something of a strategic orientation that had to sort of come on the heels of the war in Afghanistan, which was being engaged into. Uh, October 7th of 2001. And then, of course, um, the whole sort of post 9-11 moment psychologically, so to speak, for the United States in that sense. So to move to take control of Iraq under the pretense, as we said, of, of the WMDs and 9-11 was much more than that. It was a repositioning in a post-Cold War, post 
grand strategy moment for the United States to sort of make a statement uh, in relation to their position in the world. And this led to this vast expansion onto the Sahel, onto Somalia, onto all of sort of the, the secret wars and all of the planning that came in the following years, the global war on terror itself, um, initially known as the worldwide attack matrix. These were the first sort of uh, the, the first outlook for that. And so to gain control of such an important and strategic country such as Iraq, which it has always, has, has always been strategic in the Middle East, and to establish the basis that it has there, uh, the largest embassy in the world is in the green zone, is not going to be something that the United States will let go of um, so easily. Formally, the withdrawal began in 2007 and then sort of continued until 2011. But the U.S. came back in uh, smaller numbers when the Syria conflict started in 2014. It has a number of agreements with the Iraqi government. The oil resources are there, which are more than ever important to the U.S. economy. And generally, it's part of the U.S. puzzle in the Middle East, regardless of the argument about the United States having lost foot in the Middle East to Russia um, and other actors. I think you're looking at a very long-term U.S. presence in Iraq. We're talking decades here, which raises an interesting question. How Vietnam, for instance, handled the post-war period, managing to regain their independence, even finding some sort of rhythm and space with the United States and moving on. And I don't see signs of that in Iraq. I, think I see more subservience and I think more fatalism in relation to that U.S. kind of imprint, which is not serving either the Iraqi state or the Iraqi society. Right. And in a somewhat related question, do you think the end of the war in Iraq and the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan marks the end of so-called endless wars in the region? Oh, not at all. I think that for the U.S., it's what we were discussing, um, the, the whole syndrome effect was dealt with in the manner that, that they sort of designed and are managing. But I think for the rest of the world, we've seen a cementing instead of this place of force in international relations, what I refer to as this militarization of international relations. And we see kind of an opening of that logic around the world for it, it, in places unrelated to Iraq. But you see it in the Sahel, you see it, um, of course, in Central Asia, you see it, in fact, with Russia's own plans to regain its strategy around the world, of course, in Crimea in 2014, in Ukraine. Subsequently, you see a number of wars in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa restarting in that manner. You, you get a sense that what the war did was almost to give a blessing to the fact that you can go forcefully to address these issues, come what may. And I think we took a, a, a big step back when it comes to questions of peaceful management of conflicts, place of international law. And so to that, to your point, the notion of something open-ended, preventive, the long war, by the way, is the, is the, the name subsequently to the global war on terror. And therefore, these endless wars indeed have essentially sort of been normalized in our psyche and as if there's a certain fatalism to them. When war is supposed to be fundamentally based on a disagreement and there's something called diplomacy and there's settlements and, and there's ceasefires and there's ways to move beyond the normalization of that. But we have come partly because of the Iraq war, as I, again, to sort of see that place of war in our new early 21st century as something relatively normal. And I don't think that's healthy internationally. That was my last question. So Mahmoud, thank you very much for joining us on this episode of What Matters Today. Many thanks, Dan. It's been a pleasure. That was Professor Mohamedou discussing the Iraq war 20 years on. This podcast series is produced by the Geneva Graduate Institute Communications team. For more information about the Institute, please visit our website at graduateinstitute.ch. I'm Dan Graham. Thanks for listening. <laughs>